and you're asked to define magnetic flux density. So I tend to define magnetic flux density from the equations. Uh. So every time when I need to define something, I try to think of if it's related to an equation, I will start from the equation. Okay, so most definitions, or at least a majority of the definitions of physics, have an equation tied to it. So as you revise, you can summarize and put one side. Okay, anyway, F is BIL sine theta. So if I want to define magnetic flux density B, I will use this expression. So this is defined as magnetic force per unit length per unit current. When placed perpendicular. On a straight conductor, need some context. And place perpendicular inside a magnetic field or perpendicular to the magnetic field. So a reminder, if you're doing older past year questions, um, the old definition is no longer accepted. Uh, most definitions has been streamlined and uh, what's the word for it? Streamlined and minimalized to per unit, per unit. Okay, so per unit current, per unit length, and then when placed perpendicular to the magnetic field. We need all three to get two points. Uh, missing one minus one. Mark. Okay, B. Electrons are moving in a vacuum with this speed. Uh, B. Quite a fast moving electron. And the electrons enter a uniform magnetic field of flux density 4.8 milli tesla. This is my B. So here is the pathway of the electron. Mm. So the electron will go in, and then at this point, it will experience a magnetic force. Magnetic force is obviously pulling the electron downwards. So the electron begins to stir. Okay. And if you care to, by the time the electron is here, the force will pull the electron to the left. Then the electron continue to turn. And then after that, before the electron can turn up, it has exited the magnetic field. Bye bye. Okay. So the part of the electron remains in the plane of the page. So imagine the electron is on top of the page. State the direction of the magnetic field. So we can use Fleming's left-hand rule because we are trying to see how uh, the direction of the magnetic force interacts with respect to the magnetic field and the current. But when you do Fleming's left-hand rule, oh, this is a badly drawn Fleming's left-hand rule, your thumb is F, your index finger is B, and your middle finger is I. So I is opposite to the direction of the electron because the speed of the electron is here. So the direction of I would be backwards. Are you started line with me? Yes, I. So if I take out my left hand, F, B, I, and B is, and F is pointing downwards, my thumb is going downwards, I will go towards my, my left. So my index finger is going into the page. My hand will look like this. Is my camera flipped? Probably. My camera is not flipped. Okay. Right. So try it out. You'll find that the magnetic field is going into the page. Okay, moving on. Show that the magnitude of the force exerted on each electron by the magnetic field is this much. So if I look at the equation, I have V, I have B, I can find everything because magnetic force is B Q V. B is 4.8 times 10 to the power of negative 3. I know sine theta is here, but sine theta is 90. This is electron, so one charge, one electronic charge, 1 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19. Speed of the electron would be 1.7 times 10 to the power of seven.
and this is sine i. So show your substitution clearly. Oops. And then you should be able to arrive at the answer 1.3 times 10 to the power of negative 14. So the mark would be you write the right equation, show the right substitution. Okay. On figure 6.1, which is the drawing, draw an arrow to indicate the direction of centripetal acceleration of the electron when it enters the magnetic field at point X. So remember how I draw all these points here to show how I use the Fleming's left hand law? Now, if I'm doing this in the exam, I will erase it one because I don't want to have too many arrows on the diagram. For the purposes of your reference, I will just mark it here. This is point X, and the magnetic field is going into the page. Okay, so now the diagram is clean. I can draw the direction of centripetal acceleration. So just now we know that the direction of force will be here. So this will be the direction of magnetic force, which is the same because it provides centripetal force, which also will be the same direction as your centripetal acceleration. So just draw an arrow pointing downwards. Can already. One mark at X. Okay, center of the circle is obviously here. Okay, so we don't label FB equal FC also can. We just need a label for centripetal acceleration. And because you're only drawing one arrow, you don't have to label. If you draw an arrow in the exam and they will need you to label it, then they will tell you. But it's always a good habit to label. Okay, anyway, number four, use the information in B2, which is the magnitude of the force, to calculate the distance D between the part of the electron entering the magnetic field and the part of the electron leaving it. So we are asked to calculate this distance here. Okay, and to calculate this distance, it looks like this D is two times the diameter, two times the radius now, right? It looks like two times the radius. So I could calculate the radius and multiply that by two. This is a hemisphere. So, Centripetal force is provided by magnetic force, 1.3. I don't know if you put this equation here. B squared over R. I mean, it's up to you. You can just 1.3 times 10 to the power of negative 14. Or you can write down the equation and then simplify it. They are both fine, but maybe I'll do this now. So R would be mass of the electron, 9.11 times 10 to the power of negative 31. V is 1.7 times 10 to the power of 7 squared divided by the force. So all the data about particles like proton and electrons, their mass, their charges, you can find from the table of constants, including information about the mass of particles with no nuclear number. The atomic mass unit is also there, just a heads up. Lah. Okay, so if you press your calculator for this one, you'll get 0 0.020. So then hence the diameter would be 0 0.020 times 2, which is 0 0.040. A uh, friendly reminder to always write your answer in 2SF, okay? If 0 0.04, then wrong now. Yeah. Okay, part C, electrons in B are replaced with positrons that are moving with double the speed. Okay, so your initial speed was 1.7 times 10 to the power of seven. Your positrons are moving twice as fast. I'll draw a table to compare for you. Electron, positron. The mass would be the same the charge will have opposite polarity. Positron, ma, 
positively charged electron, positive Q. The speed, if this is V, 1.7 times 10 to the power of 7 meter per second, then this would be 2V, 3.4 times 10 to the power of 7 meter per second. So here are the stats of the two particles comparison side by side. Because on figure 6.1, you are asked to draw a line, which is a pathway, to show the path of the positrons through the magnetic field. So how would the positron move with respect to how the electron is moving? So I think I do a quick sketch first. This was your region of magnetic field. Okay, and your electron went downwards. So the electron go like that, turn one around, come back up. So here to here is this is the part of the electron. Okay. If along the same part and I replace the positron, the positron is entering here. The first thing I think about is I want to settle the fact that the polarity is different. One positive, one negative. So this means FB will be opposite direction. Because now for your positive charge, the direction of I is here and the direction of B is still into the page. So FBI, B into the page, I is going to the right. Then your thumb will be pointing to the left. So FB, opposite direction. It will be upwards. So the particle will turn upwards. The question is turn upwards at same radius, smaller radius or bigger radius. So if I were you, I would just, I mean, I can look at this equation now, but I also know that there's a more simplified version, which is easier for my brain. Magnetic force provides centripetal force. Okay, so I can do this fairly quickly by cancelling out my V and simplifying my equation. I have R is equal to MV over BQ. So in this situation, I want to see how the radius will affect the question. Mass is constant. B is constant and the charge magnitude is constant. So this whole thing is constant. And because it's constant, R is proportional to V. Oh, so if the electron speed is V and the positron speed is 2V, this means it will be double the radius. This is positron E plus. So here to here, double the radius means double the diameter, 2D. Okay, R proportional to E. So this is why it's worth three marks, because on your diagram, I should be able to see all three properties, uh, turning upwards, larger radius, but also larger by exactly two times. Okay. So you might be thinking, why didn't I use this equation? Well, when I change V, I also change FB. What? So FB is going to change. So now I got two variables already. My FB will change, my V square will change. No good. So I would like to simplify the equation to a form where everything else is constant, except the two things that are changing, okay? Which is, that is obvious in my table, V, okay? So when V change, R changes, all right? So repeat again, uh, electron will turn upwards because the charge is opposite polarity. Radius is two times because R is proportional to V. It is deduced from Fb equal to Fc and simplifying the equation. Let's go up here and draw 
double the dye need. Okay, so during the exam, I still think you should draw, you should bring a, I mean, I think you should bring a compass now. Because, you know, during the exam, so I'm putting here so I can roughly measure out the diameter, double the diameter. Because during the exam, when they are marking your papers, uh, they actually have a lot of line tool on line one. So based on their line tool, it is definitely possible to make sure that you draw two times the diameter. And now I'm just estimating only, okay? Because I use my Asian eyeballs. I'm not sure if this is a circle. I'll just run, actually. Let me see if I care to, hang on. I borrow their circle, then I corner stretch two times. So I'll try to use a compass and a ruler to help you during the exam. Obviously, you won't be able to do my method because I'm going to move the circle upwards and delete. So what you will do is you will measure the distance, measure the distance. Yeah. You measure this distance, wherever D is, that becomes your radius for the second circle. And then you put the sharp point of the compass somewhere here. So you use your compass to measure this distance. This will be your new radius. Then you put the sharp needle of your compass here and then put your pencil here. So you adjust the compass so that the pencil is here and the point of the compass is here. Then you draw a circle all. Then after that, you use your eraser to delete everything more. Okay. Uh, come see me uh, if you long time never use compass, don't know how to use reading. So once I do that, I just erase this part. This is not part of my pathway. Okay, and this positron still need to exit. Okay, so then I'll take my ruler, yoink. All right, something like this. Uh. Three marks, ma. I want to make sure I draw it as perfect as possible. So the positron turn this way and go up two times the diameter. Okay. So one mark if curve upwards. One mark if radius is larger. And one more mark if radius is two times. So when, when they mark your paper digitally, they will have tools to double check the actual distance. It's not that hard, trust me. Okay, so this one will be too deep. To help the examiner, I label my intention so that even if it's slightly not accurate also, the examiner won't score me. I mean, I try, I try. Okay, so that is this question. I think it's quite doable, 12 marks, and we hope for easier questions like this.